Hello. All right, it says that we're live. Welcome. What's up, folks? Uh, welcome to Tea with TC Live, where we just talk about psychology, nerdy behavior stuff, and uh, um, see where the conversation goes. We're all a bunch of behavior nerds. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Sweet. Hello. There's no agenda, but we are Nicole. live. Yo, yo, what are you talking about? No. So, what was going to be said? Was it you, Nikki, that had something? Oh, no, I think I think Dimitri should like go ahead and do angry readings of the <laughs> Skinner. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> uh, I have to say, I, I was think definitely, there's a market. Definitely in, in the next couple chapters, because they're like, because it's the respondent conditioning and operant conditioning ones. <laughs> like for those chapters, there's a lot of information that's not right anymore. So like, yeah. I was definitely like, I <laughs> am like, eh, I don't know if that's right anymore. She probably check this out. I was definitely adding some color commentary for sure. And for feedback, he had to record reading a chapter a few times recently. I had to do that with chapter <laughs> one too. So frustrating. <laughs> yeah, this is a, uh, I'm just not, I don't know. I, I get like phlegm as I sit down to read. Like I'm totally fine all day. And then out of nowhere, like I have allergies to so just spike up while I'm trying to fucking read. <laughs> that kind of stuff is pretty common. Um, yeah, that sounds normal, right? From shooting a bunch, Judy, but also. Uh, editing a lot i start to recognize um things my own self but like i was editing the podcast this morning and um this is every time i edit dimitri i notice that after you're done talking you clear your throat yes almost you clear like your all throat the time. a lot <laughs> yep <laughs> and yeah. uh, i do i do the same thing when i have to do a retake so when i'm when i'm recording i'll stop and i'll go <clears throat> like every time i don't notice in the moment when i'm editing <laughs> just talking about there. it made me want to do it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i just mowed my lawn so i definitely got some uh <laughs> got some pollen hitting me right now how was oh, how was everyone's weeks yeah maybe we'll start there yeah let's do that Did you guys have a good week no yes hello judy welcome hey guys hey how are you welcome the person behind the voice <laughs> <laughs> yes <clears throat> how'd you find us <clears throat> just surfing the net Surfing the net. <laughs> was, that old, was that an old man thing to say? It was the World Wide, Wide Web. <laughs> the- <laughs> I was on the line. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I surfed, whatever. Is that weird to say? Oh, man. No, you guys really feel old. Techno lingo. <laughs> you, you were there at old. the beginning, bro. That's what you just uncovered. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, no, oh, yeah I, I had uh, AOL 1.0. <laughs> I actually just swapped to Gmail this week. I'm kind of, so kind of excited about that. But no, nice. I um, I've been around behind the scenes. For a okay, your behavior analyst, or I have been working in ABA for about ten. Um, I think I figured out fifteen years, but um, oh, wow. I am finally um going um. So I have worked in school. Um, awesome. For about yeah, about fifteen years, and um. I've been behind the scenes, so like I said, so I, do, I have my master's in special ed now, then I did my RBT, and i um, a couple courses away from my BCBA, so I'm going legit. So awesome. Excited. Well, welcome. Water's warm. Yeah, thanks. We're, uh, we're completely uh, bereft of topics. Did you have anything that you were hoping to talk about today? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk about education. Let's, yeah, let's do that. Hey, we got good. something. Sweet. Uh, Oh, you mean like BCBA in the school world and versus the clinic world? I mean, I talked a little bit last week about revolutionizing ABA, so maybe we should talk about revolutionizing school. We'll just jump full blown into Joe Harless Eden conspiracy and go from there. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. I still work at a school, so I'm not going to say much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean. I, don't I, think... I think I think the high level, like what have we learned and what can we do better, um, is always a fun, interesting conversation. Well, how can we at least start shaping, if not completely revolutionizing education? You know, um, has anyone dug into uh, project follow through? Oh man, that was yes. done. Oh yes. So a quick, like, too long, didn't read. Essentially, for anyone out there, is uh, it was roughly a billion dollar study over twenty years. There was a lot of that done in a short period of time um and part of uh president johnson's great society project too yes and the goal was to just say what educational models out there actually held their own weight and produced learning outcomes and there was a couple that did 
Uh, there's one that did really well. There's one that did Three. pretty good. Um, yeah, and there was a bunch that did not do well. And uh, of course, in typical American fashion, we put all our money in the ones that didn't work and we kind of left the others behind. And really, it just left this bitter taste in so many yeah. that really did, in a way, revolutionize education and it's no one cared. Yeah. No one cared. Yeah. Kathy Watkins published a retrospective um, in 89 or 97 or got reprinted in 97, maybe, but it was, she did the work in the eighties um, with Carl Binder and uh, it's pretty, pretty amazing read for anyone interested, but the three models that were found to actually support learning were just behavior analytic intervention in general. So thinking discrete trials and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. uh, precision teaching, which is obviously behavior analytic. And then direct instruction, which is also behavior analytic. Oh, and the early Denver Start model had some evidence as well. This is how bad this is how bad it ended up getting. Yeah. War against the schools, <laughs> academic <laughs> child abuse by Engelman. Like that's how bitter people got at the end of this. Yeah. It's like we can do this and we just aren't. Yeah. Yeah. I have yeah. a I have a bigger too long didn't read for you, Ryan. Cool. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's my too long didn't read. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's that's it was really it's really shocking because what Kathy Watkins does is she she goes through and does a complete and utter analysis of why those changes weren't implemented, why those programs were rejected, mm-hmm. and I mean it really does boil down to I politics. mean politics, politics, yeah. and that the Watkins paper is available on behavior.org. I just put the link in Zoom and we'll add yep. it to the it's Facebook freebie. chat. But yeah, yeah, it's a freebie. Well, drop it in. Thank you. Thank you. I, had it to my yeah. I think part of it too is like the response effort to change what you're already doing. Oh, they'd have to change everything. They'd have to change yeah. post-secondary education. They'd have to change the teachers we out there now. I mean, we do uh, have to. They do. They totally have to. So four years ago, um, I went into my school district and it was a pilot program. <clears throat> and now I'm clearing my throat. I feel it. Like <laughs> you got in your head. <laughs> so um four years ago started this pilot program and it was supposed to be a one-on-one aba um classroom which it was for the first year but um this is this was the best part so i show up and there i'm like all right so where's my roster i have zero kids mm. i thought i was being oh, wow. effective <laughs> just being punked i swear to god I'm, so, <laughs> I'm like what do you mean zero kids so they, they where's wanted Ashton? To, yeah, where's Ashton? That's Cooper? exactly what I'm like. Where's Ashton? So I said, so I'm like, all right. So you really want me to do this the right way? And so I just sat with the BCBA, and we 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 did the room. We did the whole thing. I was so excited to get this done. And it we had one kid, and then we had one another another uh, para, which um I actually got 40 hours of training. Um, they didn't get the RBT certification, but they were, so every person that came in got the 40 hours of training. It was working well. I thought this was cool. the, the change was going to happen. Something was going to happen here. And then the next year came and it actually worked out even better. I ended, I did end up with like seven, seven kids and seven powers and then myself. Um, so, and then I had a BCBA working with me, um, but not to the extent that's where it started to go, you know? So I was essentially the the BCBA and then here you go here's all the paperwork and so it kind of went south but it was such a great model but the, then the higher ups like well we don't get what what's the what's the benefit of this these kids like you know don't talk they don't do this it's like oh my god are you people saying this out loud so it kind of went yeah so this year uh, they just told me that it's totally uh done that the program's um done we're back with the same uh same situation as before I started. So, where where are you located at? New Jersey. New Jersey. Okay. Yeah. It really seems like you, there's a point of no return on systems. <laughs> like it's just they yeah. just get too far, and it's like, well, maybe there will but be see, a the rebuild. problem. Is they did hire four BCBAs, which was so exciting for a school district, and um, but unfortunately, they're using them to put out fires, like in the high school. So instead of being oh. like, yeah. But being where they're supposed to be there, you know, so that's is, this is where I came into play with my back because I did start my BCBA about four or five years ago. And I was, and this is when I started this program. I'm like, you know what, forget it. I don't need this. And because it was getting a little frustrating about four or five years ago is I'm sure you, you know, all the, 
this has changed in the past year, two years or so. A lot of good things, a lot of good people have come out of it. Um, some of you here, of course, on this call right now, but it's, so it's exciting to, to now say, you know what, I'm done. I'm, I'm doing the analytical stuff. I'm going to, there's these behavior analysis is everywhere. It's not just in schools. It's not just sitting there with a kid knee to knee. It's not, it's everywhere. It's in my house. I wish I would just use it in my own house. I, I don't know why I can't do that. <laughs> the struggle is real. Be an article. Is there an article out there? Why can behavior and B C B A S not train their own kids and their own dogs. Oh yeah, my dog is horrible. He's a monster. <laughs> he's horrible. But he's a five pound terrorist. Perfectly trained in suiciding, buying my emotions and sex life. He's a monster. He ruins just, everything. Yeah. So but um so that's that's my in, my in, input on schools. I think uh, the thing with schools it's hard is that you're just fighting the, the political stuff I think is the hardest part. Honestly, yeah. I think more than anything, I think the well, reality is that like the, the, the way the pedagogical philosophy is and just where they are conceptually, it's just a huge leap to switch to a behavior analytic perspective because but yeah. you know what though? Like, so I recently started working and supporting in schools and there's people who are receptive to helping make change and they they themselves are yeah we're not there yet we're not there yet like you know we're working on it um but even now with everything going on and schools being shut down right now like this is such an unexpected opportunity to really go in and say all right you're forced to rethink things mm -hmm. like this next year like they can't go back to normal they can't so let's get in there and start talking about how they can structure things differently that as things, you know, evolve over time, we can end up on a trajectory towards where it needs to be. Like there is such a unique opportunity right now that no one would have ever asked for to happen this way, um, that no one could have predicted, but it's here. They can't, schools don't know what they're doing next year. They are yeah. scrambling and we yeah. have an opportunity to go in and say, hey, you know what, let's let's talk about personalized systems of instruction. Let's talk about, you know, these things that are going to set you up to be successful with these kids when you can't continue in the same model that you're continuing in. Let's talk about pro-social and how to structure your environment so that kids are learning how to work together and cooperate in groups and learn wow. off of each other and build some of these developmental skills of being a functional human in society. Well, the think... appetite might be whetted for um, changing things up. I think the deficit issue is what they're going to run into. Um, everyone's going to start reporting mad deficits as a result yeah. of that. When you say deficits, you mean budgetary or budgetary. do you mean skill? Yeah. We're seeing unfortunately, in I found that yeah. the CBAs are the first to go, one of the first to go. So what do you think? What were you going to say also, Nikki? Sorry. Um, Nicole? Sorry. One of us, cool. right? <laughs> well, I, just talk. My apologies, uh, but yes, <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Nikki. A lot of districts have cultural problems that need to be yeah. overcome, as far as the philosophy. So there's pockets, right? Um, my district hired BCBAs because they knew the other districts were hiring BCBAs. They don't really know what to do with us. If we um, one model, if we get one model, and the other schools go, oh crap. Right. And that's, and that's the thing, out, that's the doing? thing though, but that's the thing though. Like it's a lot different to talk about intervening on an individual level. It's a, it's a whole different animal to talk about model and program development. Those two skills are not the same <laughs> model develop. I've been through both. I've been through mo multiple model development processes. And I can tell you that like the, the, the approach, the way that you need to do it to be effective, the, the degree of involvement and, the ability to like tinker with how things go needs to be like ongoing. And it requires a very high level of skill and expertise to really understand that because you have to be able to view it, not just from an, like a specific response level behavioral idea. So like a, a molecular or micro perspective, you have to be able to pull back and see the whole scheme and system and be able to play with variables on that level and understand that stuff. I mean, I, the other thing too is honestly political will <clears throat> like before you would even like, so maybe if we want to talk about program development a little bit, cause I agree with you, Becca, like I think a model is what needs to happen. 
you know, I think the reason early, early Denver start has been so successful is because it's a model. I think the reason morning style morning side has been so successful is because it's a model. So it's like a book. It's got clear cut, like things for a hundred different problems that might come up. It's a prepackaged useful tool, you know, that, that is prescriptive and not just like philosophically driven. Now you want to definitely need that philosophical understanding, but that's a long road that you only get to from like a very individual perspective. If you like developing that model where it's a little more plug and play, I think that's why I think Hanley's been so successful with PFA because he's given a model of functional analysis that produces effective intervention. That's very streamlined and easy to digest. So um, those skills are very different though. And, and how you cultivate those, you have to either be in a system that promotes learning in that way and permits that level of tinkering because you're going to fail a million times before you finally get something right. Um, or you have to be able to be in one of those models and be able to replicate in some capacity and over time, like adjust it to fit whatever individual environmental variables you have going on. Yeah, um, but there are people out there who do this and who do have the experience and we just got to, collaborate as oh, long yeah, as the school sure. districts can afford them <laughs> yeah and that's the thing you know uh it, it, it's can they i mean morningside's them? private fits private they're all private so. yeah yeah no we need a public model they, yeah. I, my understanding is aug told everyone to go private because of the public backlash and issues once they tried going there and huh. the politics got in the way and so it was like hey if we want to make traction at all clearly it didn't work when we went on the, the public route. So let's try going private so we can at least start to impact things. I have a theory um, about this. I think the key is to locate, is to be sophisticated enough and willing to drive to locate an at-risk district that's like really fucked and be like, yeah. look, you got nothing else to lose. <laughs> so, I mean, like oh. work with me. Yeah. And, like, so I'll Hire me to do it and I'll do it for yeah. regular price instead of like $150,000 consultant rates. Yeah. You know? So I can, yeah. and, and Jim Moore like, had a good comment here. He said, you have to become, you have to become part of the organization and condition your attention as a reinforcer. Until yeah. then, yeah. all you are is viewed as an outsider providing criticism. <laughs> Jim, yeah. Jim is, man, the sage Jim. You're like, like Siddhartha Gautama of this shit. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jim. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but there, I forgot what I was going to say. There, there definitely sorry. are people who... I'm are out there doing this. There's people who are receptive. We have this, schools are scrambling. They are gonna jump. If we go, hey, let me make your job over the next year easier by helping you set up what you can do to actually get some education to your kids and not be scrambling when we shut down again. They're gonna be like, hell yeah. What do you want me to do? Yeah. That sounds good. I'm in. I, mean, we, <laughs> I, I don't disagree. Jim, into... Jim's comment is pretty interesting in regard to this. Sorry, Ryan. I don't mean to interrupt. Go, go, go. Jim's, Jim's comment. I, I don't disagree. All politics, Jim says, all politics are local. So one over, overarching model is difficult unless it can attend to local political variables. I completely disagree. Or I don't, I'm sorry. I completely agree mm -hmm. with that to a certain point. <clears throat> because uh, from, an, from an implementation perspective, you're 100% correct. But I think from a general design and in, in terms of putting together guidelines and guardrails functional pieces. And under, yeah, yeah. I think that's, I don't know if that's necessarily true because right now the presupposition of what people have and understand even behavior analysts of what a model of providing behavioral intervention is, is low VOS, you know, that's the, that's the universal generally understood way people would perform being a behavior analyst and or strictly re behavior reduction. So, I mean, and that's really guidelines. Everyone's got their own discrete trial form of intervention, but when it boils down to it, it's kind of written with those kind of guidelines underneath it. So I agree in terms of getting the job done, you have to, the politics portion of it is local, but there still should be a more broadly conceptualized model of behavioral intervention or behavioral classroom management systems, like the good behavior game and that kind of thing that can function, not just on a one-on-one -on -one individualized perspective, but also in a group paradigm. Because yeah, I'm talking about too. the actual structure of yeah. how, what, what, you know, how classrooms are designed, right. how the children interact with each other, how, like, not just, oh, let's go and implement a classroom management system within exactly. the context. I'm talking about the context of how right. we approach education. Yeah. And that's I think the other thing there is it's very, uh, it requires a pretty elaborate skill set, especially on a behavior analyst, to be able to jump in and not only network to have the opportunity to be able to do these things within think systems wise, develop them, implement them, right? So I think we're 
we're unfortunately like a shortage still of like really honed in skill sets that could well, approach. Dude, it's, it's, and honestly, like there's not a lot of people who can do it. Like you know, there's not a lot of people who have done something like it. It program development is a, I mean, it's a pretty marketable skill. It is. I, and if you can find people who value it, who want to make the change, it, you can make money and or secure good position to do so. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's rare, but it's rare because people also aren't very adventurous or willing to experiment or play with things. Right. Like, I would, if I showed you right now that there are people doing a model or working on one, who would, uh, who would want to participate? You know who would though? I think a good place to start with these where people are willing to make these changes and try this out are rural areas. So yeah. like in Northern BC, there's almost nobody, there's not a lot of people living up there. I know that there are different schools that use the Morningside sure. model because they're desperate. Their funds sure. are low, their student attendance is low. It's, they're looking for ways to improve academic outcomes and it's been really successful. And so if you can find those rural areas and you're willing to live in a rural lifestyle, I think that's one area that you could definitely um, try this out and try, you'd have the liberties of trying things and then failing and then trying again, because they're already not working. Uh, we, Jim, we, Jim is just we, dropping fucking knowledge bombs. I, I Get on I'm, here, Jim. I, yeah. Why don't you just come <laughs> in? in? Anyway, direct <laughs> instruction, has, Jim says, oh, yeah, DI yeah. has failed in every Every implementation in the Mississippi schools because the PR battle was lost, mainly because it was never fought by behavior analysts. We rely too much on our data to get non-behavior analysts to accept these procedures. You really must work on the relationships more than behavior analysts realize. And that is the one hundred percent. That yep. is it. The, I mean, but I mean, what what right. isn't about people? Like everything is about people, right? No like what is, isn't about relationships? No one gives no a one shit about data, it. dude. Right. No. No one, yeah. No one is presenting it as what are your goals and values here's how this can help you accomplish that exactly no one cares about data data is data is important for empirical verification and it's important for a variety of reasons and it's important for publication but it is not important for getting people to, or for to convince people what you want them to convince them of like is persuasion is not a numbers game right this is where what the you gonna say, terms you know you have to put them in layman terms in order for people to get that that uh knowledge of um you know, oh, I get it. Instead of like you just said, talking in data and talking in exactly. numbers, and talking it, you can't, you're not going to get that person to yeah. just jump on board. Like, wow, what, what article is that? Yeah. No one gives a shit. No one cares. And I feel like, I feel like our credential itself hasn't been paired enough with positive. Like, I think it is be. starting though. It's starting to, but it's yeah. definitely, we are being more conscious of the relationships that we're making across like we are easily able to make relationships with other behavior analysts. Now it's like, how can we cross those boundaries into other realms? Well, so with and, other people and build that trust there without yeah. kind of shoving what we know in, in their faces. Well, and so one comment I want to make too is that we can't just go in there and only say, hey, behavior analysis is going to come in and change the exactly. way to do it. We yeah. need to work with other sciences also. We need to collaborate with the evolution sciences and pro-social combination that has been developed with the conductual behavior science field. We need to bring in all of these other fields that support it. I am not just talking about going in and doing behavior analytic intervention in the way that most behavior analysts know it. I am going talking about going in and collaborating and developing a system that's, yes, beyond most of our scopes because we're not taking the time and energy to reach out to other sciences and learn what they have to offer and incorporate it and think about how behavior you know, analysis underlies some of that. So yeah, every single one of us needs to go out and get out of our, I can only learn things that come directly out Jim, of the journal. Jim drops, Jim's comment again, <laughs> uh, example, for example, he says, how many behavior analysts have assessed the power structure in districts and local buildings. In Mississippi, you must establish a strong relationship with the office secretary or you're losing before you start. You know what's funny about that comment is that coincides with a book that I'm listening to currently on Audible. Um, on uh, Let me actually get the title of it. Uh, it's that book I sent you, Becca, uh, from that uh, a Collective Bargain. Her name is uh -huh. Jane McElvey, um, mm -hmm. and she's a, she's a professor of political science and that kind of thing. And... Uh, 
she writes so she, she does a lot of union organizing and that kind of stuff so she, she does a lot of uh, like how do i not just mobilize people and get them excited but how do i actually organize them in a way that they're willing to participate in a process and take risks with me and for me you know and for themselves and the number one thing when you're trying to identify that whether it's a workplace or whether it's any type of cultural environment is to identify the power players that are natural leaders that are linchpins that will bring others along with them regardless of where they would fall in the institutional hierarchy yeah so i mean like that's an exact that's a perfect example of like understanding who the gatekeepers are because the secretary holds the phone to the the switchboard which means the switchboard is the it's 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 how people communicate to each other so if you want to have access you better have someone who's willing to give you that access sometimes and where you can bypass certain formal processes at times so i totally that's an excellent point where it's like being able to be think be strategically minded and think that way in terms of like how you generate buy-in. But that stuff is not what you learn in graduate school. And you don't think of those things as behavioral skills. You know, a lot of people would think that as schmoozing and sales and like they would almost, so I, w- I would imagine that kind of thinking w- would be considered, I know, I agree, but they would, that would get <laughs> negatively, that would get potentially tacted as like manipulative and negative though, and from people in our field. Like, I mean, and, if you and, and, do it, poorly I, you know i mean You're a I don't, about it you mean right like, <laughs> like, like i don't think it's unreasonable to look for you know the support and you know we all everything is nobody does much of anything unless they're getting something out of it so functional analysis you know what what's important to this person what can i provide that they're gonna provide what i need hey, Dale I'm, I'm carnegie totally stuff um i was gonna say so when i moved back out to reno four or five years ago now um I was working in a nonprofit for adults with disabilities and they wanted to diversify a little bit. One of the things that we started to do was, um, and this was started prior to me, but I really worked on expanding it and applied a lot of what we're talking about here. It was just the question of how can we help the education district um, locally? And it's because we had a lot of behavior analysts, we had a passion for education and learning, but there was also extremely, um, we were at the time, one of the worst uh, districts in the entire 50 states, including even Puerto Rico and others, um, on those outlying areas. And so what we essentially did was just play the politics game and had to realize it was super slow. Like if you did not have that in with that secretary or whatnot, that you weren't moving forward on things (laughs) until you had that, like you had to play that game first. And it was not, even though their statements of valuing data and outcomes, those things didn't matter unless we were we we're extremely smart in how we were doing a lot of what Jim was saying. Um, can Jim well, use can Jim use my link to join, or does he have to register independently? I sent it to him. He just oh, needs okay. to click it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah. So Jim, if you haven't, it's a messenger. I hooked you up there in the comment. Come on, Jim. Um, but the it was it was it, we went from uh, we were teaching like one professional <clears throat> development class per semester to where we were. Um, about five or six times Xing that over a few years. So like our growth was per year and our impact was increasing in the ways that we wanted to. It was not nearly as fast as we wished, um, but it worked. And you had this constant like need to justify your existence there all the time in their like evolving, changing landscape. So if they said these were our priorities of what we're working on this year, you had to make sure that you were justifying your data and your reasoning for those and knowing what those were. And they wouldn't tell you, you had to constantly be looking for and figuring out how am I gonna justify myself in the system as they change. And then the other thing was like, for example, they'd have new social emotional curriculums that came out every two or three years. That was always churning. So knowing what was coming down the pipeline was useful because then I could say, this is how we align with what you're doing um, and fit in and say like, we fit into your, your approach, but it was, I had to always be doing that. I had a couple of contacts in the school district where I just was like, every three months, text, coffee, what's coming down the pipeline? Because they knew that I was useful, but if I didn't fit into that model of what the, the larger system wanted, then we are going to be out the door. Um, it's a shame it, that it was, you have to it, actually do that, right? Yeah, but like for me, it's like, well, that's a practical way forward, I guess. So that's a game we got to play. Um, but instead of taking that model, like you said, Ryan, for like three or four years, they have that curriculum. And instead of saying, you know what, instead of changing it, let's fix what's wrong with it and move forward and like build on what we already know about that curriculum. That you, that you say that one more time. Sorry. I yeah, say that one more. 
So the curriculum that you have, I'm sorry, I have a leaf blower out here too. You're good. <laughs> um, the curriculum that you had spoke about, let's say you go into a school district, you learn a new curriculum, and then you have three years, you're, you're knee deep into this curriculum and you've learned everything you can. And then down the pike, it, it doesn't even matter down the pike because you you have to now learn that new system three years after you learn one system. So instead of teaching, or I'm sorry, instead of working together and saying, let's fix this system that we have, that we've been working on for three years. No, we just, we, they just throw it out and bring a new curriculum in. Yeah, yeah, no, that's how it always goes. It's just like, what's hot, what's new, what's it's coming just, down the pipeline. It's, yeah. It, yeah. And I, I don't know how that stops. And my understanding is from the few districts I worked in, that just happens all the time everywhere. It doesn't, and yeah. that's how it goes. Yeah. So um, the flavor that of the week like, thing. Yeah. And it seems like a very yeah. uh, flawed part of the model of what's new, what's upcoming, what's next. Um, and it kind of brings in that doesn't whole. doesn't mean it works. It's just. Well, it's no, actually it usually also... farther and farther away from what works. I've noticed. Yeah, or like if it does work, it doesn't get the time it needs to be able to be really implemented correctly. So there's a ton of fidelity issues all the time. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure like that was things that we'd run into or like, oh, it didn't work. And it's like, you've been trying this for like two two minutes a day for an, uh, a week and a half. Like you really think behavior change is going to happen that quick? <laughs> like, you know. Well, um, so it sounds like what we need is a flexible model. But, right, but, but your flexible model is going to be out with the new flavor coming in, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Not if you design it right. And no, so because, the because it has to be from whatever's hot and coming down the pipeline. So like the next publisher, the next thing, like there's that whole, <laughs> just, not sorry, if it's I just, working. <laughs> so, so no, uh, I, I, I've seen, how about this, applying, applying for jobs at school districts at some of the more higher end, like uppity ones. One of the one of the questions that, that number one, what the fuck is it with two hour application processes plus cognitive tests? Get, the, I mean, okay, but I mean, come on, whatever. One of the questions they ask is, what can you do to bring new technology and or expose students to new technology as part of your position? So it's like they they assume that number one, technology needs to be involved in some capacity and it needs to be ever changing as like part of the, the agenda that you should have uh -huh. as an expert or professional coming in to teach as if like, and again, like uh, technology is a term that I think depending on how sophisticated you are, doesn't necessarily mean digital electronics and you know what I mean? Wires and electricity, but that's, that's not the, the read I got from the question, the way that it's designed. So it's like, it's just really, the emphasis is very much on are you are you willing to change? Are you willing to adapt or incorporate new things, et cetera, um, and really shoot for that flavor of the week thing? Because that's how educational consultants do it, dude. Dude, education is a four and a half billion dollar business on the private end. We're talking about just consultation services and that kind of thing. The guy who ran for president, Andrew Yang, got rich for selling an education company. The guy, the, the, the guy on Shark Team, Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful. How'd he earn his first couple billy? He's not even a teacher, but he sold an education company, a learning company. So, I mean, like, that's where like it, it's big business to come up with the next coolest, neatest idea too. So like, there's a lot of messed up incentive in the system. And if you can schmooze the right people, it really is an opportunity. So I mean, it really, it's an opportunity for the first behavior analytic billionaire. <laughs> get there. Uh, maybe that'd be pretty sweet. Where you at Ryan? Let's do that shit. Digital platform, baby. Khan Academy only behavior analytic. Let's go. I, so. I'll, I'll put this bed in super early fit learning that's who's going to be in that that top rung there in the running for that okay oh yeah no they so they don't they, do like ongoing continuous education though right it's just kind of like catch up yeah but they they also developed like an app years ago to be able to push something into the school districts that was fluency based instruction for like a 10 minute block so I don't know where that is and if it's continuing. They were running it, of course, through a good empirical like lab-based lens, but they uh, they they 110% have that that other long game perspective into there. It was more so how do we get traction, build up the reputation, resources, etc. So um, I can't speak beyond that, but 100% their their thinking is in that line. Good. We do have Jim because, trying to join in here. Because you know what else we need is variation in selection. Yeah. Ah, with fit learning. 
I'm just joking. They're wonderful people. <laughs> dude, <laughs> but, because dude, that's if, the other thing you, too is not everybody's going to pick the same thing. So why not have multiple I, models? I, I, I like, think it's more like I'm just I'm afraid like P, precision teaching is like. I mean, I guess it'd be good if they won in the end, because then they could always say they, they'd be like the hipsters of winning, because they'd be like, "We knew it was the best thing anyway." Like, <laughs> just how be tears. For me, for me, you got to learn how to play the systems level game, whether it's the I politics agree. or the money side of it. And so, it's uh, if they figure it out, then cool, power to them. Like, if you couldn't figure it out and they did, that's variation selection its finest, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah, schmooze. I, I, yeah, I think they're doing a lot of fantastic things. I hope they do. No. At the same time. All right. We need, well, we need other options. And and the other thing I was going to say, too, is start with one classroom. Like, even, you know, get yeah. get an adaptable, flexible model that can be implemented in the classroom to where, you know, other teachers start going, man, that, I want to do that. That's the big thing, I think is we like had, that's a that's a humility thing but yeah. i agree with you on that we yeah. we had had some really cool success over years with people that would take a professional development class and have some success and then they'd come back in um for another thing another thing and it was slow but you'd have these really transformational effects over time um and it was slow relative to like a, what we're used to in a one-on-one -on -one model with certain things and someone training all this sort of stuff but um it was extremely fast for them and it, and it worked so it was pretty cool it's what kept the dealing with the politics worth it. <laughs> was seeing those sort of things. Where's yeah, Jim? we'll see. I don't know where Jim is. Uh, he tried getting in. We'll see. Man, this is a this topic is one of those like. Oh man, three classrooms, the same model. Yeah, most, that's hard. For the most part, education just beats me down. Like I feel. You have to have some serious resistance to a first extinction. Thing. Extinction, yeah. <laughs> like, you gotta deal with some stuff. Jim. Jim's like Batman yeah. in the corner of the, in the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's what up, up Bruce Jim? Wayne? Tell everyone what you do, man. Oh, I got nothing. Can't hear you. You might have to change down in your bottom left on the. Uh, mic option which mic it's pulling from so if you pop the arrow up you can select uh, same system there, you, there go. you go yep sweet <clears throat> yeah we can hear you we did he can't hear us though now probably so for those that don't know jim's uh jumped onto a podcast episode with us in the past i'll share the episode real quick um smart super cool gentleman but um, so like beyond just oh sorry do you want to go, go. No, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, beyond just like developing this model that we go in and try to shove down the throats of people like if we if we sit down and break down what are these like we talked a little bit about like, you know last week like what are these repertoires that we think children need to learn it's not going to matter like what system like the system is the bigger thing and we need to get there because there's a lot of value that can be added from it but what are the, what are the repertoires that we actually need students to be learning um you know to become effective humans in society because that's currently not coming from the department of education that, that's a that's a philosophical before. question too though because that depends on what yeah. you think well, your we function is and what your purpose is right like so like i think it's more like convincing people what functional skills and functional academics and what those terms actually mean and also giving them more effective ways to troubleshoot skill acquisition problems for example if you look at an and again i don't know if i'm pretty sure ieps are fairly universal in, in america do you guys have a, like individualized education plans like that and in, in, in yeah they have to be yeah. yeah similar type thing right we just don't like, have the same legal obligations that you guys do oh, like geez. the schools aren't as liable like i think they're technically liable but not to the same extent but it's, it's not, not as yeah, yeah it's, it's not, not as intense, intense. they just don't <laughs> sue as go. much up there yeah. it sounds like we're like yeah. twins nicole we are like twins <laughs> we're the same <laughs> BC. um uh, so uh, what i would say is that like it, it goal writing in and of itself 
is a skill that just generally lacks. And I think it lacks because of like what people see their function as, what they think they're capable of doing and how they, how they view disability and how they view skill acquisition in general. So like, I think the first step would be like refining and teaching people how to more effectively identify a skill and troubleshoot it or break it down and then putting it in terms that produces a more advanced skill in the future rather than the way it's currently set up where they they're really just trying to meet certain standards so that they can always claim that there's progress being made even though the progress is nonsense you know like it's literally i mean there's so many at least for me i've seen iep goals that are like you know five out of six opportunities 40 percent of the time <laughs> like it's like what 80 percent of the time it works 60 percent of the time yeah like it's really fucking nonsense stuff that is not is not actually producing learning. It's not really measuring anything that's going to give you an outcome that matters. Like, so getting people to change their point of view in terms of like the only percentage that matters is 100. And then once you have 100, the only thing that matters is achieving a particular rate of response because that's what fluency is. And that's what keeps something stable. That's what keeps it going on over time. That's what keeps it maintained. Um, and like, those are very difficult pills for people to swallow because the amount of work that goes into doing that. Did you figure out your thing, uh, Jim? I don't think so. Man, your mic was working for like three seconds and then it stopped. <laughs> Trailer Park Boys Anything is now? life. Any luck? No, not so much. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I'm here. Uh, yes. There you are. Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> um, well, I, I think that, uh, I, let me just start by saying my, my first encounter my, i'm trained my phd is in school psychology so uh before i got eyeball deep in autism treatment uh, 20 something years ago most of my practicum experience was in the schools and it was all a consultation model so there was <coughs> i had not actually directly provided services to a, a, a child directly until near the end of graduate school so uh, and that's a that's a totally different model that I find that most training programs don't do a very good job in teaching DCBAs how to do that. And so one of the things and, you know, one of the one of the, I got in some trouble a little while ago because uh, I have a pet peeve of when I see behavior analysts try to go into a classroom and put a clinic in a classroom. That's not what that is. <clears throat> Classrooms are not clinics. And uh, if a child needs medically necessary treatment, that needs to happen somewhere else. And, um, you know, so a lot of times when you go into a school, it's almost overwhelming to see everything that's wrong and everything that you know you could fix. And I've just seen over my career, people just really shoot themselves in the foot just by going in, just kind of like, boom, boom. I mean, we do to, to, a, to teachers and administrators which, what we'd never do to a kid with autism. We start firing demands at them, right? Right out the gate, we come out with, we got to do this, we got to do this, we've got a program for this, we got a curriculum for this, we got, and really all they want us to do is get Johnny in, in 12th grade to stop beating everybody up. You know, I heard someone earlier say that we all get all the, put all, all the fires. Well, every school district I've effectively been able to work with long term had to start like that. I had to go in there and I had to really make sure that I put the resources towards solving their problem. They're never going to see us as a problem solver beyond what's immediately in their face if we don't take what's immediately in front of their face out. That's the same case for my job now. I work for a nonprofit. They hired me to do early intervention. And now three years in, they're now starting to say they, they run a residential psychiatric uh, treatment facility. They run day schools. They have all these other things that we could help with that are just broken. And I just didn't really say much about those programs because I wanted, I needed to make sure that I got the one thing they hired me to do right. Mm -hmm. And so now three years later, they're like, hey, we kind of think we want this ABA stuff in our residential treatment facility. And hey, we want this, what can ABA do for our day schools that are kind of a disaster right now? And, and that's also a lot of pairing. I have to sit through a lot of meetings that I really hate and die inside often. And, and really, I've baked a lot of cakes because I knew people liked certain flavors of cakes. And I've made sure I know everyone's birthday and made sure I knew what every one of their kids was doing. 
And uh, those soft skills are kind of where we tend to stink because we are so all, you know, if you talk about where behavior analysts come from, we're all kind of objective minded, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what really attracts us to the field. And that's not really why a lot of teachers get into that. Well, and that's what I was going to say, you know, also, and going along with what you're saying is we can't go in and give them the answer. We have to go in and get them to start thinking about the question. You can't just walk up to someone and say, believe what I believe. Well, you have to I go think in it's more and, than that, though. I, you know. I think it's I think it's being able to d develop programming that can account for chaotic variables and not trying to exert control over every little detail. Like when you I think the phrase I think when, when Jim is talking about not bringing a clinic into a classroom, it's clinics are looser or I'm, I'm sorry, the classrooms are looser learning environments. They just are. So I think you have to have a looser conception and ability to navigate that in terms of how you structure contingencies and what kind of expectations you place so that the skills that you learn are a little bit more fluid in that type of situation and responsive to that, that little bit less hyper controlled situation that you get in a clinical circumstance. Yeah. And, oh, and personally, yeah. after working in both, I, I, I think over time you learn to like it too. I mean, personally, I like, again, I've, I worked in a school forever and I've been back in a clinical environment. I, I would, I, I honestly can't wait to get at some point back into an educational setting because I like the freedom that you have with by giving into the reality that you can't control every yeah, little thing. It's more interesting because that's also from my perspective, like a lot of pressure from a professional perspective, right? Like people want, like when you're in a clinical setting, like you're always troubleshooting to find the one silver bullet variable that you didn't account for and the massive analysis that you were doing across all the BTs that you're looking for. Yeah. But in reality, how is that programming for generalization? How is well, that programming and, for natural environments? How is that, you know, it's right. not. So like it's, you need yeah. to be able to like shed some of that laboratory mindset, you know? Well, yeah. And that, that same thing. Yeah. It, Sorry. We, no, 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 you're good. Um, we, the, the world is not a lab setting, like for sure, you know, and if these students are only, yeah. only learning in this discreet, narrow, hardcore, you know, it has to, it, they have to be able to perform the skill in a flexible, in a changing environment. They have to be able to respond to a lot of different environmental cues and still get the job done. Um, and people are complex anyway. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of different things. So yes, we need to be yeah, training. I, I think, I think that's absolutely right. I'm at a point in my career, let, let me make no mistake. I've had all the frustrations everyone else has had, just blatant violation of children's rights all of that, I've had all of those experiences in school settings, but I'm kind of at the point where I'm really, we gotta look to our field as to why this is a problem. I'll give you one example, Dimitri just hit up on it. We, we did um, a study years and years and years ago where we got four different teachers to run concurrent operant analyses while they taught in public, general education classroom settings. And we eventually got it published in Java but that was after a fight where I thought Brian Awada himself was going to burn the journal down because of all of these uncontrolled variables. I'm like, but look at the data and look at the fact that we've got these teachers doing not your little analysis, your little single operant analysis, but exactly. very complex concurrent operant analyses and still teach. You know, and it and it's it's and that stuff gets lost because we want to look at all of these single little variables exactly. that are highly controlled. It's like trying to put a tree in a in a vacuum and say how how fast does a leaf fall to a ground? Well, it doesn't matter. It's like how fast does it fall to the ground in Vermont versus North Carolina versus Texas with all the contextual variables at play. And so our field from the very ivory tower uh, research base down has got to really start showing more usable consumable solutions and you know i'm teaching at fit this this year and i have some of my students now looking to the behavioral school psych literature to say this stuff's been buried on you know greg hanley got isca from a study published in school psych review in 1997 you know that he just stumbled upon and um you know, there's an intervention called tootling. None of my students had ever heard of it, which is basically, you know, kids like to tattle. Well, what happens if instead of tattling, you give, uh, you set up contingencies that reinforce them telling on 
students for being good. And now what if we do that organizationally? So instead of saying, you know what, this behavior tech sucks. What if we have everyone now attending to the great things that they're doing? It changes the whole culture. That literature has been there. Chris Skinner published papers on tootling like 25 years ago. And our field won't even embrace it because it's, oh, it's, it's not tight. It's not whatever. And so I'm kind of at a point in my career, I'm like, what do we do to, to, because we're just in a little bubble right now. We're not getting outside of it. We're not doing very much to get outside of it. Will you be my dad? <laughs> I don't know. I've been fussed at already this morning for social media. This is why content. Jim's one of my favorite so. people ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you know, Jim, the thing is, is that I think part of the problem is that, you know, especially what you're describing, you're, you're, you're identifying is that like, I mean, there is a lot of work that's done on the experimental end. And what you're describing, in my opinion, is the, what the applied work would look like for behavioral dynamics, behavioral economics, you know, those other a little bit more ancillary things that don't get touched on in Java and more conventional circles that, re, that are fluid and, and, and responsive to contextual changes, right? Because they're more algorithmic oriented rather than like, just like straight up linear thinking. And I don't, I don't know how you break that yeah, break that I, I, cycle but i mean I, like that that's just about enough of us saying well this is how we do it because this is this is the reality of our science i don't know i, I guess i'm stupid but when i was you know a young graduate student i thought jab was our basic research journal where those things you just talked <laughs> about be. was where those things were published but somehow <laughs> java became that you know and then I thought it was ironic that in the late 90s, Java had to put out a special issue on translational research. Wait, the first, you know, a lot of people don't realize the very first article published in Java was using attention to shape behavior in general ed classrooms. You know, the good behavior game was published in Java, yeah. you know, and then somehow it became like JAB2. Yeah, it is. It's JAB with people instead of just JAB with rats and whatever. It is. You're right. Yeah, that's what makes it completely unintelligible to most people too. I mean, it's undigestible. You, if you don't have a, if you're not a post grad, how can you effectively take a Java article and really do anything with it? Honestly, like we have to be very honest about that. Like you have to be able to engage in some semblance of translational practice, which is such a sophisticated, high level repertoire that like it, it makes it completely pointless and, and it makes none of the stuff really useful. Yeah, translational research is one of those things that's like, I don't know. The, the amount of fucks I have for that are very limited. I thought Java was supposed to be a translational journal, but apparently I was wrong. And so, you know, it, I think it is getting better a little bit. Uh, you're starting to see more diversity in what they published, but to be able to get in, to get back into the school settings, you know, the things that, you know, now that I'm teaching in a strict behavior analytic program, it's like, where do these people learn how to be consultants? I don't see it. I don't see it in the curriculum not there that's what so we do our podcast for doing it <laughs> i mean the thing what about the soft skills do you think that uh teaching people you know i don't know negotiation skills dialectic public speaking you know rhetorical skills i mean even critical thinking like do you think the where are those things and where where is the role of that like whose responsibility is that from your perspective like, shouldn't that be the schools? Shouldn't that be their programs, their graduate works, their graduate program responsibility? Oh, oh ab absolutely. You know, Greg and I spoke at uh, the Tennessee conference back in November. And one of the big points of contention he and I keep having is, you know, I've used interviews to go into both analysis and intervention for most of my career. But the problem is, is how do you train people to do that? And Greg's like, well, they just do the open ended interview. I was like, Greg, I know you can go into the room and you with your New England accent and your salt and pepper hair and everything that makes everyone go gaga over you can get what you want out of a parent. But have you seen a brand new behavior analyst from an online program try to sit down and do that interview with a parent? Who's just like really excited to be there and help their kids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they ain't gonna work. <laughs> and they've not been mentored on that at all. And I, yeah, so I think you know, and I can just think about how many behavior analysts would cringe, especially in the academic level, to hear the word soft skills. Like, I thought I was going to get acid thrown on me when I said, you know, hey, we should look at this motiva motivational interviewing that the counselors are using 
because that could be a really effective thing to do in a lot of our open-ended interviews. It is. Uh, I can't, yeah. my, my, my education background is in counseling <laughs> psychology. That's what I got my master's degree in. Um, I went to a school that did CBT and evidence-based practice as their primary focus. I, I learned how to have a relationship with the person sitting in front of you and how to, you know, get them to engage in behavior change um, for That's complex awesome. human beings, not just, you know, these little people who are just starting to develop some of these skills in the, you know, VB map. So why don't we flip this conversation a little bit? So what are, how about this from your, from experienced people's perspective, what are, what are the primary soft skills that you should work on and what are some steps to do that actually? from your perspectives? Uh, I don't have any like empirical approach forward, but for me, it's just been a lot of practice messing up and, and going forward. So you can do this in a little bit more of a controlled way and try to do it with other people that have maybe mastered them. So if I was gonna go back to like the education example, I might practice how I'm gonna describe things and pitch things in the next meeting with the behavior analyst that has been, you know, um, in those in the past and can give me some feedback so I can practice those sort of things a little bit of like a BST model but I like we also know that it takes in the moment you delivering that with cadence and like it needs to be fluent you know like there's there's such important variables there that I think you you do learn each time you try to engage in those soft skills I don't know. Like that's not I, specific, but I, I yeah. What's up, Nicole? Say it. You don't have to raise your hand, man. Just uh, undo your microphone and talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's muted. She's muted. Hold on. You're muted. I, You're muted. I yeah. Unmute. Um, <laughs> we're very polite in Canada. I know you know this, <laughs> and I like to raise my hand because I don't like to interject. <laughs> uh, you can interject um, whenever you want. I know. Um, we our yeah. board brought in somebody last year to teach behavior analysts soft skills. He was outside the field. I just posted his free course from Coursera he's got going on right now. Oh, nice. Um, he did behavior skills training on us. It was super uncomfortable. We all had to speak in front of each other. And he taught us different ways to have those tough conversations, active listening, and I forget what else. There's like storytelling, like different things like that. And I think we, like I got a lot out of it and I wanted to do it like again. I was like, I need this for like a week. I need every day someone to teach me and practice and shape my uh, soft skill behavior. But, and he defined it really nicely. And he's also very entertaining. So it was really cool to have someone outside. Yeah, that's uh, the active listening thing, the learning to mirror, repeating. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. Got a lot of sales, a lot of sales guys are amazing at that stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like learning from marketing and the other things I've been getting into have helped over time. But again, like yeah, there's a, a, an arts to it, which is just like, I haven't spent the time figuring out what the actual variables are. And you, know, mm -hmm. you learn those over time, right? Through the contingencies. So I think we need to get yeah. comfortable with having like, and this is where I think that, you know, the, the, and this, and this is, I can't believe I'm going to say this because I'm almost <laughs> hardline, hardline everything. But I think that uh, I think we need to get comfortable that there's a there's a there's a level of the way skills develop in humans and people in general. I think you start off very prescriptive and technological. You know, you have to because that's how you learn the, the base ground rules and that makes you dogmatic. But over time, as your fluency gets better, as you get more comfortable with how you do it, you start developing a nuanced perspective of it. And then once you start implementing things from that kind of a nuanced interpretation over time, it kind of transcends to where that automaticity kicks in, but also that, uh, that the ability to play with the ideas and really, you know, f seamlessly weave back and forth be be between stuff without even understanding or thinking about it, you know, and that's the artistry. And I think we need to be okay with the fact that, you know, it, there's a reason Michael Jordan is Michael Jordan and like some B league high school, junior high kid is that them, like there is a difference between excellence and, and like it, not everyone can necessarily get to that level. But I think that, you know, getting comfortable with the idea that some of this is a little bit more art than it is science in terms of like the way, in terms of the way that you would measure it, I think matters. And, and the whole people being interacting with people, you may be able to quantify that from an experimental perspective, but I think being able to 
you know, be persuasive and that kind of thing. I mean, that's, that's why some people become president. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's why you see those types of characters come out. That's what charisma is. That's what those like intangible things that we don't, that we can't necessarily measure are. And like, you can cultivate some of those things that lead to your ability to, to express those. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that we need to get comfortable with the idea of some of the stuff is going to feel woo woo at times and not try to just measure every little thing that matters. Cause not everything needs to be measured. Like you only really need to measure the stuff that you're trying to change so you can prove what you're doing. Everything else can be some feel. I think yeah. playing. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was gonna say, like, did it work? Yeah. Yeah. Did it work? Yeah. And how can I either improve upon it or do it different next time to be even more effective? But yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And even just like taking that and getting, well, being, um, I guess having humility and then delegating to those who know and like accepting that maybe you may not have those skills right now, but being able to observe those who do or pick out people who do and being able to delegate those roles to people in a team, because I think a lot of us try and take on um, things that we know we can technologically kind of break apart but th that doesn't necessarily mean you can do it effectively and I think accepting that we don't have that without practice is something that a lot of BCBAs and I mean people professionals in the field probably don't get experience with yeah getting comfortable with not being the expert on every little thing matters is, is a big transformative piece of that I do agree with that big time Judy you 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 said you uh so you started out as a intervention specialist you said right um no a teaching oh uh, just um, teaching okay well uh, that's even better actually, i started out in, in on wall street oh okay mm. whoa so. and then you went to teaching and now you're going into behavior analysis yeah but um i was always i got my uh kind of dipped my foot in by accident into the aba world when i was teaching um okay. what was the thing that well, how about this as someone who's probably the most fresh in terms of like what the impression they had that brought them to that what like what was the thing or how did you get attracted to it what was the thing that sold you on it um well initially this probably back like nine years ago um i was in a classroom and i was just like wow this is really great this is so it's cool it's 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 interesting. And this teacher who is the, wow, we can do this and let's do this. And Hey, look at me. It's like, Whoa, what, do, do, does that how is, is this really what it is? And, you know, after further investigation, there's, you know, obviously a, a whole different realm than working just with autistic students, which is um, definitely needed anyway. Um, but I just looked into it and found um, that it was just really, you know, more than just discrete trials you know, um, that I was being taught in a classroom and she took maybe 20 minutes to teach me. I'm like, so you're telling me that this is behavior analysis and you just taught me in 20 minutes. And there's gotta be more to this than like, you're kidding me. So I did look into it and, and, you know, it was, it was great. It was a great thing. And it just didn't work at that moment. Um, I think I was just working. Um, and I also did home ABA therapy and I was working with a clinic that just was not to, um, didn't really abide by a lot of the uh, code, the ethics and, you know, those kind of things. And that, that means a lot to me, um, especially coming from a world, um, you know, working on Broad Street down next to the exchange and, you know, nobody followed any ethics down there, that's for sure. And I was just tired of it and um, needed to get into something that was, um, was better than that. But then, so that's when I fell off the wagon and I'm like, forget this. And now I'm back on the wagon. And part of it is because in the past year or two, I've met a lot of people like yourself and like Ryan and like um, Megan um, Megan Miller. She, you know, has a, puts a lot of cool stuff out there, and it's it's relatable. I mean, Ryan, his his daily BA stuff is so relatable. That is like huge, and it's it definitely you know puts a a, a face on it that's like not this like you know listen to me oh here's my pie chart oh here's this chart look at read this you know like really this is this is not too you know welcoming you know accessible yeah. so you know um he put a there's a welcome mat out now in my opinion um so you know i'm i'm happy to be back in it and i plan on, on changing the 
I can't change the world, let's just face it, but together we can all change the, the, uh, the front, the face of it, um, you know, and try and put a, a real life, you know, aspect to it. Um, yeah. like Jim, you know, like Jim was mentioning, you know, you got to go make your cookies and go visit the person and go talk. And, you know, we were talking even before Jim got on the call, even before that, you know, you have to get that gatekeeper on your side. And even when you do have the gatekeeper on your side, it still doesn't, you know, still doesn't yeah. mean it's going to, you're going to get through to the pearly gates. But I think behavior analysis as a whole, uh, I think I have a positive twist. You know, I went to a, hand, a couple of Hanley um, things and, you know, he's just, there's just a lot of people that have this great attitude and, you know, and, and that it's out there. Han so, Hanley is a, is, has a, character. he's quite the inspiring character. <laughs> and, and we have, when we still have too much of this, let me write a review paper to say why this is terrible. I just reviewed yeah. one for Java. Uh, and it was just another one of these, oh, act is garbage, so let me find a whole bunch of studies that show it's not effective. Right. And yeah. you see this, I've made a Facebook post earlier this week, it's like, you know, some people have designated themselves the gatekeeper of, of this dogmatic, you know, shrine to Skinner. Uh, what's, what, yeah, what's what was that? Funny? Okay, give me context, because I saw your post. <laughs> I saw your post the other day. What was that about? Because well, I was well, like, because I'm like, shit, I'm reading science of human behavior. And I wonder if Jim's like talking shit right now. <laughs> no, I think, you know, I, I, my training, I was fortunate enough not to have like a very established <clears throat> publishing mentor, because I think what happens is that that's when that's how you're mentored. It's really hard to see the world anywhere else. I was trained by a scientist. And so I, my view of Skinner was never this, this. Oh, we got to have this, this Skinner's pragmatic approach. That's this little box, and it can't. Nothing can be, you know. And and a lot of what I see that's touted as radical behaviorism these days looks a lot more like methodological behaviorism to me. And it's like we can't see it there. Oh, that's it just a fact. Garbage, and that's it's just not worthy of anything. And so, if I wanted to do a review to show that anything is ineffective. If I just narrowly define how I search for articles, I can come up and I can come up and make anything look ineffective. And so that's that's just happening a lot. I serve in as, as an associate editor on one of our journals, and we get these papers all the time. It's like someone's got an axe to grind with Ryan O'Donnell's new program. Well, then they're just going to go out and define search parameters to show that that's not effective and not mm -hmm. really, you know, <laughs> I have to point out, you know, hey, you're submitting this anti-act paper to Java and there's Java publications on acts that you did not include in your review. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. shows that your <laughs> exactly. methodology is flawed. Yeah, bias. So, yeah, welcome to Retzlaff and Greer et al. in 2020. And I just and, don't know, I, I mean, of course, none of us were alive when Skinner was still speaking, but I just cannot imagine him getting up and saying for something that's new, that's not, no, my gosh, that's such a violation of all. No, I think that he's actually said, when you find something interesting, drop everything and study it. Yeah. You know? And it's so, so right there. The, and the I think thing it's is the same thing when, when, when someone becomes a dogmatic figure, mm -hmm. like if you hear how conservatives talk about Ronald Reagan, if you actually go back and mm -hmm. look at what they claim Reagan said, that's not really anything close to what he said. He's now become this almost deity figure and i think for some skinner's become this deity and it's like if you say anything that goes against that then you you're you know you're you're engaging in blasphemy and i just don't think that that from what i've read of skinner and i've read just about everything he's ever written i never got that sense because i didn't have somebody telling me this is the only way to look at the world and so, and I think when you look outside of our science to other legitimate natural sciences, that's, that's, that's not a healthy, dogma is not a healthy approach to an expanding science. So. Especially if you're having it in some people, people esoteric journal that people too. aren't clicking into. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like there's a whole nother layer there of like, we, we, we have these arguments in very weird, small spots, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. What, what do you mean? I like, wanna, like why you, are we I fighting? Like, why, why is there such, this why is has not Jabba deterred? Well, like, yeah. Like, Jabba, 
it should be called the Journal of Functional Analysis now? Well, like, so for example, I know of a, I know like a publication years. that's in the work to try to knock down um, some ACT stuff. I don't know if it's the same one that Jim's talking about or not, but I know that there's one in the works. It's going to be coming out. And I have not read it yet, but as an example, um, I could quite literally read like the bias in some of the segments that I read that were shared with me. And uh, for example, like they were citing the, the critiques that Palmer had on RFT, but they forgot that there was a reply to that critique and that he critiqued and there was another reply. So it's like, anybody that's reading this is gonna realize like you cherry picked that reference. And <laughs> you they, did and, not and put they the forget totality. To mention that, they forget to mention that Palmer's on record saying he's not really read much of the RFT literature. Yes, <laughs> and you, yes, 100% on record. And so there's things where like, it just, um, that paired with, um the impact factor i'm sorry but it's not super influential and then you want to back that up again people like steve hayes he stopped replying to those things because they they aren't being heard and he, he's being heard in such larger communities and being taken seriously by such larger journals that it's almost like if you want to attack you need to realize that probably the best way to go in here is kind of like in the education system you work your way in, you talk with them, you discuss things and you try to work and collaborate together and see where, where you can fill these holes. Like, it's just, well, you does that make sense now, Dimitri? You can, go to, you can go to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, to Books A Million and see in the front on the display, A Liberated Mind by Stephen Hayes. Yeah. And it's the only book in the entire store written by a behavior analyst. And so, I, I you know, we can talk in our small, but I want to- since That's like not in the reference on, section, at least. So, so if y'all like to be controversial, I'll be one right now. Matt Sicoria and I were talking re earlier this week and he just did an interview with Justin Leaf and you know, Justin's really anti-social stories. And oh, yeah. I typically don't use social stories except that we're now starting to find that as kids' relational abilities become arbitrary and complex, they tend to respond better to social stories as some of our data. Uh, we can discuss that a whole nother day. But Justin was talking about his his dissertation, which was kind of like the seminal nail in the call for the social stories where he compared uh, parent uh, interaction therapy, I believe is what it was with social stories. And he was telling this narrative about how one of the kids said he preferred social stories, but he did better in the other because y'all made me do it. And so mm -hmm. I asked Matt, I said, so he just let us know that there was a confounding variable in that study that no one caught. Escape extinction was used in the parent-child interaction therapy, and apparently the kid could escape the task and daydream and do whatever they wanted to in social stories, so you didn't force attending, and you were forcing performance in the other condition. So escape extinction could explain those differences much more than social stories are terrible. And, all. and see, we don't ask those types of questions. We don't say, you yeah. know, just general confounding, what else could explain this? We just say, nope, that's bad, that has no data. Well, unfortunately, social stories, rapid prompting method, all these things that we hate are in the mainstream and we're not. Rapid prompting and we should method ask is, ourselves is definitely magic as to why though, that right? is. We agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, uh, agree, we agree on rapid prompting method being magic, right? Like social stories, I could almost, I can almost get with you on social stories because like we're just talking about ch verbal behavior, you know? I mean, so what, what digesting a asked, textual it's verbal, a, well, think about yeah. the verbal level stimulus. of rule governance, yeah. uh, 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 responding yeah. to rule governed contingencies yeah. that you have to have Correct. and exactly. the ability to yeah. arbitrate over complex relations. Exactly. And, and now someone needs to go back and replicate Justin's dissertation, but give them the peak transformation pre-assessment and see what kind of relational mm -hmm. abilities the kid has, I, I guarantee. Or even build a BST component so that the practice is there so that they can actually perform in accordance yeah, to those rules. just keep escape extinction constant yeah. over all the conditions. But I'm, I'm telling you, as you see kids' abilities to navigate arbitrary complex relations grow, I would predict, I think it's at least an empirical question, would these kind of like embedded rule governed modeling things that social stories intend to be, would they tend to work better for, for kids who now have better relational abilities. And what I was gonna point out there is this is the essence of what happens when you look at the world a little bit differently. And that is uh, going back to Danielle, I was listening to you say this at one point, like what's the difference of 
radical behaviorism and functional contextualism because I was editing this morning <laughs> whenever you said that. And like, that's it. When you look at the world a little bit different than your philosophical assumptions, that's how you can lead to questions like Jim is talking about. And that's why you don't see them with people that don't subscribe to those. And then you start to get these different citations and different arguments and potential bias going on. It's just, uh, that, that's the importance of philosophy. You just described it, man. It showed a real world. I'd example. love to give a shout out to my friend Jordan Belisle, who has an article in the current perspectives on behavioral science or whatever the heck it's called now. Nice. And he looks at something called mod model dependent realism, which is from other sciences, and then tries to explain all um, everything that's within the field of behavior analysis. Now, instead of making it like camps, is if you take this model perhaps for different operants, different approaches might be more effective. And that's just a great article. It's, it's not light reading, uh, so, but it's in the current, and I think he's got a link. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can find it real quick and post it in oh. the chat. But uh, he's, he, he's made it available on, on Facebook. Let me. Man, I, I love these, this, I love these kind of conversations. They're so, um, they're like, Jim, I can't I stop so, nodding. Like it's I so, so much good. love the zero, the zero care that you have for uh, the reality and reactionary stuff that you would get from this. Um, but I think, I think full circle, this is this conversation is what makes it so hard for us to be more broadly disseminated, achieve mainstream status, find general acceptance across disciplines, and not have this like cloud over our heads of being these sticklers for rules and bullshit and like rather than being which what we are which is fellow collegial helping professionals right because i don't think that's we're not viewed that way you know it's funny because like when i when i bet if we did a relational test on people we're like okay when you think of a school psych you think of a helping person when you think of a teacher i mean teachers are up there as far as the most trusted people in our societies i mean you know uh next to like doctors and nurses you know um, when you think of a guidance counselor or just or a, a mental health counselor, like all those people have, I bet the emotion would be hug, hugs or clouds, right? But then you put behavior analysts and I bet you'd get a ruler because you get smacked on the knuckles when you talk to them. So I, I think that, uh, that that's, the, that's the adjustment that needs to happen in terms of the types of relationships and reframing of the types of, of the types of interactions that we have with people. That's holding us back. And I think this discussion highlights the fact that even internally, because there's so much like, honestly, I think it's so it's super self serving. I think what you're describing is like this, this, uh, this attempt at intellectual supremacy, and total dominance where like, there, there doesn't want to be a permission or allotment for a diverse array of perspective and views that I, I'm not sure exists in other sciences. But then again, I don't know enough about what other sciences are like, on the back end you know, to be able to say that. Cause I mean, like, I guess the question would be like, is it like this in physics? Is it like this in biology or chemistry? Like, is it like this in, I don't know, I, psychology, does it, do they have the level of infighting that we have where it's like straight up almost ad hominems publicly? Yes. <clears throat> I mean, my like, understanding is yes. If you, I if mean, you, they do. Right. So then I guess at, what makes it different? There's a book called it's reality is not what it seems. <laughs> and I okay. can't remember the author's name. But it's kind of like a history of physics from like a layman's perspective, yeah. and yeah, they had this infighting like two like two hundred years ago. Yeah, because from but, my understanding, uh, Newton was like laughed out of the room multiple times. Well, Newton Newton actually withheld some of his most <clears throat> important findings about light for twenty five years, waiting for his chief rival to die. <clears throat> yeah, you know, but but we need to be more like Einstein, who when he submitted his first paper on relativity and won. A Nobel Prize for it. Two people don't realize this. Two years later, he revised that theory. He came yeah. out with another paper and said, "Oh, okay. Some of the stuff I said in this first paper wasn't quite right." Well, they don't go back and say, "If you go back to the classic 1984 slash 1992 article, yada yada yada, nothing's changed since then." No, it's like science. Dude, I know the FA shit forward. is the FA stuff. Like it literally, like that's my. That's my personal bone to pick in the world. So like, I'm, I agree that like that whole fight, I mean, it's so intellectually dishonest and self-serving. It's pathetic. And like, if you can't see through that, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's any help for you because dogma is real in that, in that perspective. 
but yeah, that's uh, that's hard. I, why why is there such an antithesis to complexity? Like I understand that as scientists, we want the most reducible thing, but like it just feels like there's this antithesis to accept the fact that maybe some of the the hyper reductionistic conclusions that we've drawn are limited and if we want a more robust account of nature we need to add to them why is there such a resistance to that because I mean, we can't control complexity well and it's usually like if you wanted to look at the act rft stuff mm -hmm. as opposed to skinners it's usually people that will not completely read the differences between the two and understand the differences that go in and open their mouth palmer admitted to it <laughs> and it was it was it was uh uh, cool that he did that, but also so many people were misled as a result of him critiquing something, not understanding it, it being treated as the uh, uh, a solid critique when in reality, he misunderstood what he was talking about. Yeah. And continues to not correct that. That's what he admitted in Matt Scorey's podcast. But that's the thing, like that's so intellectually dishonest. Yeah, like but it's, that's it's... what's selected for in our field, unfortunately, is like if you have a name and like in science too, like you can get away with this sort of shit. Yeah, um, that's, that's surprising. I, I like it's hard it's, for me it's to also imagine a, a, people get it's away It's a with lack of like shit. critical thinking and logical reasoning skills that are being taught to people. Like I'm not um, like you, if you have the right mentors and people around you, you can start to understand this, but it's, 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 like, it's kind of funny because it's like, a counterproductive fear of credibility. Like you're making yourself less credible by not engaging in the change, but you're afraid but that if, people are going to not take you seriously if you were wrong once. But if, if you're trying see to, that quote, I if y'all can just read that quote I, I have up on the screen and apply it to our field, that's exactly where we are now. And that was, yeah, that perhaps was, the decisive discovery of the Milesian school of thought is that of a different style? Is that of a different style of thinking, where the disciple is no longer obliged to respect and share the ideas of the master, but is free to build upon those ideas without being afraid, to discard or criticize the part that can be improved. This is a novel middle way, placed between full adherence to a school and generic depre dep depreciation of ideas. It is the key to subsequent development of philosophical and scientific thinking, nourished by past knowledge but at the same time, the possibility of criticism and therefore improving knowledge and understanding. Carlo Rovelli. You know, I listened to that book on your recommendation, Jim. It was amazing. Fantastic. Fantastic book. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. you talked about is physics like this. Well, that's the, from that book, this is the development of physics from Newton, <clears throat> you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, uh, and uh, I have a, I have served on the BACB board with a former chemist who's now a behavior analyst. And she said it was the same with chemistry. And if you mm -hmm. consider that our field is somewhere around 100 years, depending on when you start, I think we're just still like toddlers trying to keep our toys and not share. Well, yeah, well, can I bring it back to the conversation we had last week where this is a product of the type of society we've developed where you have to fight for the seemingly limited resources. You have to fight to put yourself out there the best and you go full on whether it's right or not once you pick a position and it's go hard because you know if i'm flexible i don't i think i'm going to get kicked out you know i'm not going to develop my um you know supervisees or those sort of people to to come and build on it because then that's going to take away from me and where am i going to be at that point you know when they surpass me like our culture does not support that yeah, I mean, behavior selected by consequences. So, I mean, yeah. money talks and bullshit walks. Yeah. I mean, that's just the way it is. And also, like, power is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a corrupting influence, and it's definitely alluring and seductive. So, I mean, like, especially if you're in an intellectually, an intellectually driven field like ours is, that's more, you know, that, that's where success is dictated, not just in terms of efficacy, but also in terms of publication and yeah. academic notoriety. Like yeah you're gonna do whatever it takes to hold on to that torch i mean that's just like human behavior that's people right so yep. <clears throat> the question is like then do you do what we're doing where yeah we start out by calling it out and talking about it openly and having those discussions but then what do the the, the follow-up the natural follow-up question to that then is how what do we actively do to engage it and attempt to change it for ourselves rather than just complain about it because i think yeah. part of the thing that i've worried about in these discussions because we've had so many i mean we've done 20 plus podcasts uh, that we've published and 
of the 30 plus that we've recorded almost every time invariably like uh, like we result in a conversation where it's kind of like this where it's like well fuck we're just hitting walls man we're like wiley coyote chasing this damn road runner and all i'm left with is just like the guy i just keep getting blown up like so i mean at some point we're gonna have to build a better mousetrap i think if we want to actually like win this intellectual battle of ideas that we're at despite the politics of it so I think yeah. that's where like well, you know, and, yeah. so with Jim talking about Greg, I think Greg's success and the mainstream of behavior analysis, despite the resistance, because I mean, it took him seven years to publish the first results on ISCA. That that first paper in 2014, that was seven year old data. That was not, yeah, yeah. you know, so you got to think about it. Like we're in 2020 now. So that was 13 years ago. We could have had ISCA. You know what I mean? Well, well, we had data that the study I mentioned that Greg found in School Psych Review, we sent about seven data sets to Jabba in 1996. Even worse. That were like the pre-ISCA kind, kinds of things where we we're like, listen, and we showed where we got nothing from a traditional analysis. Even worse. Yet the kids still tearing the classroom down. And right. they just, we just never could get it through. I sent that paper back revised eight times to Jabba. And then by that time, life just got lifey and I had to move on to something else. But yeah, it's, it's hard to break through that. And, and, the, and the damage that you can do to yourself, you know, uh, within the field is very, very real. I guess I'm just an old man that just doesn't really give a shit anymore. I don't know. But I mean, that's the thing, though. Like, you have to get to the point where you don't give a shit. And also, like, you transcend it. Like, move past it. I mean... I mean, again, let's again, I don't want to speak for Greg Hanley because I'm not going to say that. But I mean, like, what has he done in the last two years? It's like super surprising to the world. He quit his job in academia and started a business, said, fuck it. Like, he, he realized <laughs> that going to the practitioner was fast, uh, like it's, much faster, yeah, more than, efficient than goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's seeing, more you're efficient. Seeing you're seeing Mark Dixon do the same thing. Uh -huh. Yeah, you he's know? retiring, I believe, at the end of this year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's so gone like from SIU. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, he's gone. retired. Yeah. So, I mean, like, these are two people who are publishing giants in the last 20 years, at least like publishing, like, uh, well, well researched and well reviewed people with, you know, strong, strong reputations saying the system doesn't work for us. Like, so what hope do people like, you know, your average Joe really have in making these kind of changes or people like us who like to drop the F bomb on the Internet too much? Like, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that like you, you circumvent some of those things and because they be, they make themselves obsolete over time. And for me, Not this to say is that where... peer review will be obsolete, but I think that like over time, you know, in terms of what the cutting edge of the technology looks like, it'll just sidestep peer review until it, it becomes so undeniable that it's, it's quote unquote worthy of investigation because of the body of evidence that it's left in its wake in terms of capitalizing. Yes, Ryan. <laughs> it works. Yeah, it, it works. <laughs> no, I was going to say, yes, 100%, Dimitri. And I think this is where you can take a play out of uh, the ACBS movement or that contextual behavioral science movement and see what they did is they're like, we can find this process elsewhere, not have all the kickback and issue of that, and still like go through this valued process of peer review. And so that's what I was trying to get out of <laughs> Well, but um, one of the and them just keep moving forward into larger and larger and larger journals and settings. And like that just oh. helps with their collaboration, their perspectives and things like that. You do risk a few things there, but that's what the journals I think are risking most with this, uh, yeah. that approach. But one of the things that they do differently as well is there's a lot more open resources there. There's a lot more, I'm going to give to you. Let me reach out and give to you. Whereas, you know, yeah, in the first the field, there's more of what can I get out of this? For sure. The but first like 10 years cooperation or so. requires someone to start first. Yeah, I was gonna say the first 10 years or so of ACBS Preach. was just a, a pay what you can for your membership and access to things. They finally made that like a $10 minimum or something like that. But um, it's a very yeah, different like approach. Like, yeah. yeah, it's a very different well, approach. You, what was interesting you, is they actually found, they actually did research on this, believe it or not. They were looked at a values-based model would it produce enough to sustain? It actually did them better than if they charged a minimum like other people were at the time. So they took their data and, and approach and used it for yeah. something that worked and people, if they needed to, could access it for free because they're in a position there. Like, 
You would think our field would sell, you know, like someone like Dixon, who's like literally been on Dateline for his research in gambling. You think that we would be celebrating, but now it's like, it's like he and Greg are like living the same life, just one's in the severe behavior field and the other's in the verbal behavior field, you know? And so it's just, but why, but why, you know? And instead, that just doesn't seem to me to be how science is, you know, should move forward. But, um, you mean yeah, like they found their niches and they're kind of pursuing the niches rather than like trying to well, maybe collaborate and create something even more, even newer and cooler. And, and to get into the, the peer review process, it's not only so narrow, it's just slow. You know, like the Olympic lifting paper that we just got out in Java that a lot of people have, have been uh, citing here recently. It came out, it was accepted last year and it came out in print, you know, at the end of last year, we did that study in 2011. Mm. and it and java kept it we went through seven revisions on that paper seven over two years of just revision and then another year just to get it in the journal so we're talking about a nine-year gap like people are consuming it now in 2020 that study was done in 2011 you know and (laughs) and now it's like on the journal that i'm a uh, associate editor for it sometimes will take me three weeks just to get people to agree to serve as reviewers so I can send the paper out to even start the process. So I will say that the process. behavior analysis and practice special issue uh, on the pandemic and things like that, hats off to them. They move faster than I've ever seen that process move. And I get why, and I get some of the, uh, you know, less stringent review process they went through, but it's possible, right? You can speed that process up. I mean, that's the thing, man. Like they're too concerned with constantly being like, the, it's the search for perfection in publication, which is problematic. Like sometimes I, I would say it's better to get some volume out there and just have some attractions or corrections because like the fear of publishing failure is a real problem in the journals too. Like, and that's where uh, I, I, I would just love to see a lot more edgier shit out there. That's like, maybe not perfect but maybe has a hunch and has a worthwhile thing to look at and a thread to tug on and uh if it's wrong it's wrong and if it's not it's not and then it it opens up research lines for other people too i think there's just a lot of intellectual hoarding that happens well and also i mean goes back to it too like if we want people to change their behavior like we need to model it also like we need to just all go out and start modeling like hey i was wrong yeah. Mm-hmm. Here's my new perspective based on new information. Like being wrong is a nobody bad. does that. Therefore, nobody does that. Well, that's kind of hard in today's world. If you, uh, it's never really anybody's fault. If you think about it, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the president can't blame, take blame for shit. I mean, how can we really? I mean, you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so open. Like it's never anybody's yeah. fault, man. I mean, like, are you kidding me? It's not. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, wow, we are way over time. This is this is marvelous. I want to um, thank you everybody for coming. Yeah. And, uh, thank, thanks, Jim, for coming in for a robust conversation. Judy, thank you for the the springboard topic of education. We really appreciate it. It's uh, it's always nice to come in here and play topic roulette, <laughs> <laughs> and see kind of how uh, how much fun we can have. Um, I hope that there's a lot of resources that are tagged. I think we quoted a lot of stuff today. Project follow through. Personally, of all the stuff we talked about, the project follow through thing in terms of education is like a must read for anybody who's interested in in understanding kind of the history of evidence based practice in education. And, and it, they, if they want to go down that rabbit hole, that is the seminal work that starts the thread for you. <clears throat> um, and uh, you know, as far as the dogma conversation, that'll be probably be to be continued across. Uh, it'll be a common theme across everything that we ever do so yeah <laughs> um, but uh thank you everybody for coming today this was super fun yeah. i'll stop the live thank but you. if anyone's if anyone wants to stick around here and still keep chatting feel free to what time is it i'm gonna go eat breakfast